Okay. Hello, Perfect. everybody. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. I'm joined by Hilke Shellman today. She is the author of The Algorithm, a great book that explores how organizations and recruiters, employers in general, are using artificial intelligence to make hiring decisions. So it's a great pleasure to be joined by you today, Hilke. First of all, congratulations on the book, not just for the great reception and all the media coverage, but because it is a great, great book. Well, thank you for, for your interest. I'm just so um, heartened to see how many HR folks are interested in this, right? Because, you know, I'm an outsider to the industry looking looking in from the outside and maybe being a little bit skeptical of some of the methods. Um, so I've been, uh, you know, just really happy how well it has been received and people have been telling me, oh yeah, we had similar experiences. Thank you for writing this. So I feel like um, I'm so uh, happy to hear that a lot of HR folks are interested and maybe, you know, want to, uh, also take a more critical look at some of these tools that are flooding the industry. Fantastic. So obviously, yes, your background is in journalism. You're a professor yeah. of journalism. You write for various publications. Tell me about what made you interested in the book and what the process was of coming out with the idea for this book and why this book now, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it, it started, um, uh, you know, totally... In a, in a funny, funny, dif different way. I was at a conference in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of consumer lawyers, had nothing to do with AI. This was in 2017. In fact, they probably still to this day don't know what AI is. Um, but I needed a, a, a ride from the conference to the train station. So I caught myself a lift and I just chatted with the driver and asked him, like, how was your day? And he was like, you know, it's been it was a, it's been a weird day. And I was like, oh, yeah, tell me more. And I'm a nosy journalist. And he was kind enough to share that he had applied to a, a baggage handler position at an airport. And he got a call, which he described as, you know, a robot calling him and asking three questions, probably, you know, some sort of pre-recorded uh, voice called him. Um, and he was just really like a little bit freaked out. And I was like, what? robots interviewing humans. I've never heard of it. Uh, so that was sort of the start. And then I went to different conferences and I went to PSYOP and I just saw how much um, uh, tech is flooding the HR industry and how we are trying to, you know, quantify humans. And I got really interested in this. I have like a, a little bit of a tech and science background. And I was like, oh, maybe we found a better way. Like maybe we have finally found a way to supersede bias hiring managers. And uh, this is like the new world and this this will be wonderful. So, and there weren't a ton of journalists. I saw how the industry was changing and I was like, oh, we really need to take note of that, right? Like it's changing in a fundamental way. Um, so I started writing about it, did like a piece for the Wall Street Journal. And, and um, as my body of work grew, I sort of was like, oh, I think this is a book. This is a larger, this is a huge change in the industry, not only in hiring and work surveillance, right? We see it in, uh, in sort of now we, people use signals uh, for firing. So this is like huge, huge change. And so I felt like this deserves sort of a larger opus of a book and I started writing it and it's been uh, really a joy and talking to all of the folks that I get to talk to. And one of the things I love about the book is that you did the research, not just basically talking to companies and reading about, you know, news articles and where they exist reports on their tools, but you kind of also turned yourself into a guinea pig, a candidate, right? It's a, it's yes. a little bit Tim Ferriss. <laughs> I, may have, I may have turned you into a guinea pig too. Well, that's well, <laughs> yes, alongside yes, yes. with me. <laughs> yes. I mean, so, I do think that like, um, uh, you know, like it's it's really hard to ob obviously understand, you know, I, I I had a lot of limits at the beginning to understand what's inside these black boxes. How, how do these methods uh, working? And, um, you know, I'm, not that technically skilled, if somebody would show me an algorithm, I probably wouldn't even know what to do with it. But I did feel like, wait, we do uh, we do care about the results, right? Like, is this fair? Is this unbiased? And you know, a lot of the companies, as folks know, like claim that this is like a new democratic way of hiring, right? It's more efficient, it saves money, it's unbiased, and uh, it picks the most well qualified candidates. So I felt like okay, well, can we test test some of this, right? Like some of these tools are based on traditional methods of personality tests. So why don't we take a traditional personality test and then compare it to uh, uh, to the AI tool that uh, says it will predict your personality, whatever, how dominant, conscientious you are based on your social media. So we did like, I did like small sample sizes um, and, you know, they're just anecdotal um, ideas because obviously, uh, you know, two, three, four, five people, it's not enough to actually accurately say 
oh, this tool is not working, but it might give you a hint that this might be problematic. So I think some of the tools, um, uh, I found out that I had multiple, you know, even one tool that looked at my Twitter and one looked at my uh, LinkedIn and was supposed to find my big five and my disk personality, had like uh, uh, sort of the opposite personality traits uh, in the two media. And it me might mean that I have use, uh, you know, sort of start use different personality traits on different media. But if it's not stable and it changes within the five minutes between the tests, it might be just too brittle to be used, right? Um, so I think those are kind of things. And then I took some of these questions actually to computer scientists, sociologists, and they did um, much, much larger sample studies, right? And had like similar results. And so I can now much more authoritatively say, probably, you know, these tools do not work as advertised. And I think we need to do a whole lot of more of those studies to figure out, uh, do these tools actually work and do they actually uh, find the most qualified candidates? Are they actually unbiased? Um, so, but, you know, I also had a lot of fun uh, test testing the tools and sort of maybe understanding what vendors say. So vendors would tell me like, you know, in pre and one way video interviews, um, uh, you know, I was, you know, I was like concerned maybe if there's a transcription that was that was generated of my audio, like what would happen with people like me who have an accent? What is with people who maybe have a speech impairment? Does the tool um, uh, transcribe as thoroughly and, and well as for folks who are maybe native English speakers and don't have a speech impairment? So vendors would tell me, oh, yeah, no problem. Like our AI test, you know, is like calibrated for that. Or they would say, oh, there is like a threshold. If you don't meet this threshold, whatever that may be, uh, you'll get an error message. And I was like, okay, well, so I thought like, well, let's test it. So I would assume in some of these tests, I would get an error message, right? So one of the tests I did was a tool that's called Curious Thing AI uh, that was marketed uh, to Western companies having maybe uh, trying to build call centers overseas. And, you know, one of the things people need to do is speak English. So I set up the interview. Um, and I spoke English to the tool first and answered the question, you know, how I had experience doing this work. And I got an 8.5 out of nine uh, English competent. And I was like, wow, this tool really works because clearly, you know, it understood how well I speak English. And then I thought, well, let's see what happens if I speak German to it. It's my native language. Um, and I thought it would get uh, generate an error message, right? Because obviously I would never meet some sort of uh, 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 I don't know, consciousness or under, you know, like some a, sort of like a, thre a, thre a threshold or something. Yeah, yeah, like some sort of threshold, but whatever that may be, because clearly it would just be gibberish to the tool. Um, so I just read the Wikipedia entry uh, on psychometrics in German. So I didn't actually answer any of the questions in German about the job. And I sent it off and I got it back. And I was confused that I didn't get an error message or a mistake, uh, but I got a six out of nine. English competent. Um, and I was very confused because clearly I didn't speak any English. And I did the same thing with another tool that actually generated a transcript of the uh, of my words. And it was like total gibberish because obviously it tried to make sense of like the German sounds and into English. And it was like, you know, does sociology iron nematode? I mean, half of the words I didn't even know that they were English. Um, so I was like, whoa. And the interesting fact I got a 73% match to the role. Um, so I was like, whoa, this like total gibberish and I'm 73% qualified. Um, so I think, um, you know, I think some of these methods show that uh, some of the vendors might be overselling their technology and how well it works. Um, and I actually think um, this might also be something that might be empowering HR managers. Like if I can do these uh, uh, little tests of edge cases and like figuring out what the results are, I think anyone can do this, right? Sort of like yeah. fact check the tools as much as you can, um, you know, steal my methods, uh, use this kind of stuff um, and sort of figure out, okay, if you have like a 90 second personality test with photos that is supposedly based on the big five. So let's have a random, I don't know, pick 30 people in your company, do a traditional uh, personality test and see if actually some of that um, correlates right to the results and so that you, makes so you you're a saying hint. if you are an HR buyer or somebody who is you yeah. know considering embarking into this new brave world of AI you should take an experiment you should test it yourself with your sample etc well, one thing that occurred to me as I was reading the book which I think is you know provides uh, uh, fairly objective and data-driven criticism of some of the overclaiming that exists in the field of emerging AI technologies is, I think it was Yuval Harari, he once said, you know, it's not that I have a lot of faith or hope or 
you know, uh, very optimistic views on artificial intelligence, but I just have a very low expectation for human stupidity. And, you know, <laughs> could, could, there be a, could there be a sense that, you know, we are still, this is still a work in progress, it's early days, and that maybe AI doesn't need to be much better or, you know, perfect to be better than a human interviewer or a recruiter looking at a CV or resume in six seconds or a hiring manager who basically brings their own biases there. So have we thought about maybe the potential if it's not quite there yet? Do you think it has potential to bring some progress vis-a-vis -vis traditional methods? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it does. I'm actually not saying we should go back to traditional me methods, right? Because we know that humans are super biased and um, I don't think we want to go back to these days because we've seen women and people of color like underestimated and underrepresented and people with disabilities in the workforce for decades, right? So that is probably a result of biased human hiring. So we don't want to go back to that. Um, but I think this might be a good way to think through like, okay, how should we hire? Like what are the methods that work? and what is actually predictive for uh, success in the job. And I think sort of a lot of the AI tools go away from a job analysis and actually figuring out what are the five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 skills that you really, really need for this job um, and just sort of think through like, oh, okay, these people who are in the job, let's have them play the game and they have these 50 person, 10 personality traits that we're now looking for, actually goes away from like sort of evidence-based stuff where we know uh, we don't actually want to hire for whatever these 50 people have in common, because they might all like baseball, but baseball has nothing to do with the job. So we, look, we should be looking at that. Or maybe they're all risk takers, but does risk taking actually have to do with the job? So what I'm trying to do is like, let's actually have a conversation, what works and how we should build these tools. And I think there hasn't been a lot of conversations. I think there has been a lot of vendors that put in really cool plugins and built these like beautiful tools. Um, and I think sort of uh, a lot of humans, um, I, mean, I mean, I think it's the way HR buys these tools, right? They're built to like, they're, buy, they're bought to be more efficient and save money. Like they're not, I'm not buying a tool to hire five more people to oversee these algorithms, right? That sort of defeats the purpose. Like I trust right. the vendor that the technology works. So I think that's sort of the problem. We buy them to be more efficient. And on the outset, they kind of work, right? They do generate a list of ranking. And I do have to say, even though sometimes I knew that maybe some of the tests I'm doing, some of the gamified assessments that they're, lots of questions is like this is even you know uh, pumping up balloons is that even meaning that uh, does it actually translate to real risk behavior in the world right or am I just a daredevil in games or you know does this have anything to do with the job what does pumping balloons have to do with any kind of job that you know I could possibly be applying I did you know once you see the results or you see your ranking you you're know, like 80 percent blah 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 it is hard to not believe it even though we know that the underlying methods might be so uh, faulty. And I think that might be some of the things that HR managers also uh, fall in the trap. It's like they do get a ranking um, and there is like a clear, you know, 80 percent, 80.5 percent, you know, match for the role. And it's kind of hard to question, even though you, you see this and you're just like, OK, I'm just going to call the uh, 10 most predicted people. But how are they predicted? How does this ranking come together? I think that's we, we don't know a whole ton about. Um, I think another tip is like if companies don't have even half a technical report or some sort of report how they tested these tools, I think that's a huge red flag all uh, uh, in the first place. And then I think uh, secondly, like I think somebody needs to really assess these technical reports because I think a lot of times I've seen very you know, theories and this is still a little line. I'm like, okay, just give me the numbers. What is actually happening inside the tool and how have you validated it? And some of the tools I've seen I don't know, they were validated on college students in their 20s, mm -hmm, some, you mm -hmm. know, a gamified assessment. And I'm sure it may work for those, you know, college students in their 20s, but that does actually does that actually generalize? And we know um, that things don't actually easily generalize until we test it. So if they haven't tested, I probably wouldn't use it or I demand more testing. Uh, but if we have to like really, really scrutinize these tools. Yeah. And not like sort of fall back into like, oh, let the machines make the decision because it's easier, right? It's like a layer of obfuscation. It's like, well, the machine said it. Um yeah, must yeah, be yeah. right. Yeah. So I mean, obviously, even since you probably started working on the book, which I would imagine was a couple of years ago or so, up, up until now, there has been a big rise in 
regulation, legislation, and the field of responsible AI or AI ethics is now much bigger. Do you think that's a good thing? Could could this be a deterrent or mitigating kind of uh, approach for some of these issues? If you have buyers that believe whatever, candidates that believe everything, and sellers or tech platforms that overclaim and oversell, is this where regulation has a place? Um, I do think so. I mean, I do think like I'm I'm happy to see that things, uh, you know, that folks in the industry got a got a bit more skeptical, right? Like I think 2017, 2018 was sort of the beginning, and we all believe, whoa, like maybe this is like a magical change. Um, and I think we all get a little bit more realistic over time that like, oh, maybe these are not as good as promised. Um, but I think um sort of in in hiring and a lot of these tools at work, I think what what is sort of a problem is like we don't often know. Is the tool, you know, how is AI used on us? Is it even used on us, right? I don't even know that as an applicant often. Um, and we don't know how it's being used. So I think those are a uh, real question. And it feels like, you know, a lot of vendors are not going to publicly come out and say like, oh, company X tested our technology and found gender bias. Um, and, you know, we, we apologize. Um, but I think also companies are really afraid that they're going to have a class action lawsuit if they come out and say, well, we use this tool for two years on our, you know, like recent graduates and it didn't work. They're also afraid. But the problem is with all of that is like there isn't a whole lot of progress where we where sort of the market regulates itself and like pushes out the bad tools um, because we don't actually know what are the bad and the good tools. So I think um, regulation could actually help here. I think it shouldn't stop. You know, we've seen in Illinois that companies need to tell folks if they use AI. Um, for for video interviews, but I think that's I call this like forced consumerism because as an applicant, if you tell me you have to do this uh, pre-recorded interview, in all likelihood I'm going to do it, right? You may tell me there's AI in it, but I'm just I still want the job, so I'm going to do it, right? Um, but you know we see like GDPR, um, the general data protection law in Europe, where actually uh, folks can ask for the data, and I've talked to folks who have asked for the data and scrutinized it and actually won uh, settlements and other things because companies did do mistakes, make make mistakes. And um, uh, so I think we see like there's a little bit more uh, transparency and push for that. So I think uh, that would be helpful. I think, uh, you know, we have a law in New York City that uh, mandates audits um, of, uh, of AI tools annually. Um, I think the problem is we, there's not a whole lot of clear standards how these audits are going to really be looking. And uh, should they only look at, at gender and race? Should they also look at sectional identity? Um, should they look at people with disabilities? Um, you know, we haven't seen a whole lot. And we're not seeing a lot of companies comply with the law and putting those audits out. Um, and I do have like, I've reported on audits in the hiring industry of two companies who paid uh, a third party to do an audit. And both of these audits were full of conflict of interest um, because, you know, one party paid the other to evaluate their tool. Um, I think everyone knows that we should be skeptical of that if there isn't an independent third party. So I think we have a long way to go. But I think uh, transparency, even maybe telling applicants how they were scored to have some sort of appeals process. So I sometimes feel about, you know, other high stakes decisions making might be if you get a mortgage or like a FICO score and there's problems with that system, but you at least know your FICO score and you can appeal it. Um, so the question is like, maybe companies need to tell us you were rejected because of X, Y, and Z. And I can uh, fight back and say like, yeah, you're right. I didn't have that experience. So yeah, true. Um, but, um, you know, you could say like, hey, wait a second. I actually didn't have that job for five years. Like the resume screener must have ingested my data incorrectly. Um, so I think, uh, you know, I think we have uh, a lot to learn. So um, I think regulation is needed, but just more transparency in the industry would mm -hmm. already be super helpful. Um, and maybe long-term studies, if companies could work with researchers or companies could use do themselves long-term studies of like having people who are uh, uh, hired with traditional methods and people who are hired with AI tools and sort of have, you know, the labels of like hire or maybe or no, um, hire all of them, see like in three, four years, what what is happening and which methods actually work would be super helpful to all of us. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So I think we do that, but I have really haven't seen that, right? We've seen um, yeah. uh, we've seen companies do this long-term study and I think that would actually help humanity and possibly the company not to make bad decisions mm -hmm. because, you know, as a company, it's not a good business decision to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to 
essentially a not random number generator that is even possibly discriminating or finding people based based on the wrong criteria that's not that's not a good business decision mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and so all of that kind of tackles the issue or the problem of accuracy or inaccurate tools that are oversold then you know another kind of known issue is that often these companies pretend or claim that it's impossible to game or fake the assessment right so the, so let's assume for a minute that there is some accuracy or is as accurate as was as what's going on or what has been used in the past is the issue of fake ability game ability one of the important points you make is that actually especially with the rise of generative ai actually there's a little bit of a rebalancing of mm -hmm. this historical asymmetry where organizations might use tools that are totally unknown and uh, mysterious or cryptic to candidates, but actually that now candidates can use AI themselves to improve their scores of performance. Can you think, can you give some of these examples of how yeah. they might so, want to do I mean, you know, I talk about like, you know, I think obviously there was always this asymmetry, right? Companies always had the last word in making and hiring decisions, but traditionally I put forth my resume and I wrote this beautiful cover letter and I, you know, gave you the bits and pieces of information that I wanted to give you. You could check references, but there was a lot of, uh, a little bit of power on, on, on the candidate side, but now it feels like, um, maybe I haven't even sent an application in and you already rejected me by ch checking my social media, right? And gave me a score. Um, so if it's very it, disempowering and sort of candidates send out their resume, they never hear back, they have no idea how it's being screened. So I think generative AI, now some candidates feel like, okay, this is really helpful. I can have ChatGPT write a cover letter. I can have ChatGPT build a resume, help me polish my resume, write it better, right? Um, but also like, help me train for job interviews like what are the most commonly asked questions and maybe what are the best answers to those commonly asked questions right like what are my strengths and weaknesses what are good things that people have said um uh, so i think it's helpful for for people to train and uh, you know some of them are sort of laughing a little bit some of the applicants feel like oh yeah i generated my cover letter with ai let, let ai uh, you know let the best ai win um, so, you know, they know that companies use, use, use AI on the other side. So I think they, they feel a little bit more, uh, uh, maybe a little bit more powerful, but, um, uh, to, to the system changes. Um, I think we've seen also a little bit, and I think companies need to be maybe a little bit more aware of that, um, sort of also, uh, pushing this into, uh, maybe more of a cheating territory, like, you know, in, uh, uh, pre-recorded, uh, uh, sorry, um, one way video interviews, if you get a pre-recorded questions and you have like two or three minutes, you might actually have the time to put the question in chat GPT and get good answers that you kind of just read. Um, so I think companies might want to be aware of that. I've also done testing where I deep faked my own voice and put in the writing and actually no one was in front of the camera and I still got um, a qualification and a ranking so the companies wouldn't have known that there was no one on the other side and I just faked it with a robot. So I think we've seen impersonation of candidates, right? Somebody else who speaks better than me and does really well in interviews, I have them sit in and then I show up on, on day one. And I think companies are also realizing some that maybe that is actually like a hacking threat, right? Because I work remotely, you give me all the access to companies, uh, to you know your company system and I start um, sucking out the data. So I think um, there needs to be a, a, a lot more security stuff built in. And I think we've seen also that hackers were able to hack into some of these systems. And, uh, you know, I do think that as an applicant, I assume you would safeguard my information. It's very personal information that I presumably put on my resumes and my job interviews. And uh, we need to do a whole lot of safeguarding there as well. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, presumably, well, compared to how life was 500 years ago or 5,000 years ago, I mean, reputation always mattered, right? <laughs> I needed to decide whether I trust you if, you know, you're my barber or the butcher or, you know, certainly a doctor or dentist. Now that is still the case, but it seems like all this could lead to a very complex cat and mouse kind of race or fight or chase. But what, on the upside, you think then from what you're saying is that it will have to push employers, recruiters, and hiring managers to be smarter and use better tools to truly understand whether people are a good fit or not for the job. Yeah, and you know, I think I think also like um, try to have people 
try out the job, right? I mean, I'm not saying that it's like actually practical to have to hire people and then let them go in four weeks, right? But like, is there, like, I actually think like maybe virtual reality will help us a little bit here to actually test people um, and do some of the job because we know that's pretty predictive. If you figure it out, what are the main mm -hmm. skills of the job? Ask people to actually perform those skills. Um, and so I think maybe digital and, and um, you know, AI tools might actually help us to be, to be better with that if we figure out how to do it in a valid way, way without discrimination, um, um, I, I think that could be really helpful. Um, so I have a lot of hope into the tools. I just don't think that like uh, some of the tools that have been built with like facial expression mm -hmm. analysis or social media analysis are actually there yet. I mean, hopefully science will improve, but uh, you know, sort of also post the question, maybe it's a little deeper question, but you know, we as uh, you know, a lot of hiring folks over decades have tried to look under the hood, right? We always wanted to know, like you present yourself in one way, you know, I'm sure everyone and their mother have always said in a job interview, if they're a team player, yes, and here's how yes. I've been a team player, right? No one's gonna say, oh, a team player. Uh, and uh, always <laughs> say you like the always say you like the cookie when you're offered the cookie, even if you don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> right? uh, you know, everyone always wanted to look under the hood of candidates, right? Because we yeah. know that they put themselves in a really good light. Um, but I think we've seen a lot of misfires in HR, right? We've seen like graphology. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, handwriting analysis that people have looked, and it, it sort of is feels a little eerily the same, right? That we look at like, how do people express themselves and can we find their innermost personality in that? So mm -hmm. is that in your handwriting or is that in the way the words that you use on social media, the words that you use to describe a job? Um, so I'm just like kind of a little bit cautioning that like until science catches up and actually proves that this is yeah. true, we might be we should be might, might be wary of using these tools to hire people because it's unproven science and we've seen misfires in the industry uh, i mean thank mm -hmm. goodness some of it has been uh, changed right like hire you famously abandoned the emotion analysis uh, the facial emotional analysis and and thank god because there was no proven science underneath it uh, but then we've seen other companies now use it again um so uh yeah so my hope is like let's have the science maybe catch up and if it works totally use it uh but we, we're not sure it works in all kind of in, in all different ways that some companies are proposing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. makes sense so let's let me just um you know zero out a little bit and mm -hmm. ask you first i mean because you know ai more broadly going beyond recruitment and hiring is now so ubiquitous and in every conversation um especially as a journalist and somebody who has written about this, what, what are good sources for people to keep informed and actually don't consume garbage and noise, but you know, what are either articles, magazines, podcasts, etc. Where can somebody go to learn more about AI, either in this field or work more broadly or in general? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I read a ton. I actually also kind of write, we, we, books on AI, although they're sometimes mm -hmm. a little bit, you know, they're six uh, months or, or, or a year away. Um, I also happen to look at some of the <laughs> methods cards of like OpenAI pu putting out a new tool and sort of understanding, okay, what is in there? Because actually companies do describe uh, narratively, how does a mm -hmm. tool work? Um, but I think what's helpful for me, I keep up with like uh, actually academic journals. Um, I look at the, I mean, I work for the popular press and I know that a lot of the mm -hmm. stuff is uh, fact checked and is uh, um, uh, uh, people do uh, do talk to people and sort of figure out what is a new trend. Like I, I think the Wall Street Journal is doing a great job at covering the the industry mm -hmm. and sort of figuring out like uh, what what is happening. So I, uh, stay up on top with them. I think the Guardian has a very um, um, often a little bit more skeptical take on technologies, mm -hmm. and I think that's also really helpful to look at that. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a bunch of HR websites that I like to uh, keep abreast with new developments um, and just generate if AI. I mean, I try the tools myself. So, you know, some of the, mm -hmm. the, the experiments that I do in the book, I've done myself. Like I use ChatGPT to, to try to write a syllabus and, you know, it was in the early days. And, um, you know, I, I, I stumbled over the hallucinations because, it's you know, it's quite short, the syllabus. So I was like, that's ah, not really going to work. But it was also like, you know, some folks in investigative reporting like suddenly had written a book and I was like, wow, I didn't know that Mark Horvitz had had written that book. I haven't read it. I can't believe I was, you know, I didn't see that. And then I looked at it and I was like, oh, he didn't write that book. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, so I try to use these things, but always with uh, uh, with thinking of like, OK, is this accurate information? And like, you know, that's really important for 
for journalists, but I actually think that's probably also important for many, many other um, uh, uh, jobs and functions, right? You want to have mm -hmm. accurate uh, signs in your tools that you use for, for HR. So I think thinking about like, okay, can I use some of these uh, uh, cool tools with also understanding how accurate is this? Like, um, and is it actually therefore usable? I mean, I think mm -hmm, some of mm -hmm. these things in HR, uh, you know, like a chatbot would be great for the for the policy handbook or like how many vacation days I have left, right? Like some of these like very uh, clear uh, transactional, uh, yeah, transactional. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah. the, the chatbots would be great, and I'm sure they can. We can get them to 99.99999 percent accuracy, and that's probably really good enough. Um, and I think there can be a lot of um, uh, uh, innovation and things that can be done. I think the question is like for high stakes um, decision-making like hiring, social services, you know, we've seen mm -hmm. a lot of criticisms there that we use fraud detectors, but then they start uh, uh, saying, oh, if you're a woman, you are more likely to commit fraud. If you are if you speak uh, the, the, the native language, you're less likely. Yes, those are probably all statistical inferences, but on a personal level, it's actually discriminatory. Um, and I think that's sort of a lot of these things that we see in hiring too, right? That people feel like, oh, that's not fair. Well, technically zip codes probably are predictive. If you live further away mm -hmm. from a job, you'll quit more uh, uh, more easily. Uh, so if you want to ret uh, retain workers, mm -hmm. uh, you might want to use that. But we actually know that it leads often to discriminatory hiring practices because people live in different parts of the of, of the city and uh, at least in the United States and there's uh, historical segregation. Um, mm -hmm. So I think um, you might bring in you bring in discrimination through the back door. So I think we see this a lot that this is happening all over in high stakes decision making. And so I think some of my methods hopefully will actually work to uh, scrutinize other other sections of, of businesses where some of these tools are, are being used. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess like AI tools now for journalism and I look at like how that was that was going to be my last question, right? Where are you? Because a lot of a lot of a lot has been said and written about whether it replaces journalists, uh, journalists, it augmented them. It's a helpful resource. Where are you when it comes to, let's say, generative AI vis-a-vis -vis journalism and writing since this is actually what you teach and what you train students on? Oh, yeah, totally. So I do feel like I think generative AI is actually really helpful. Uh, to help us write text and to be sort of a, an editor in a way that, you know, it can polish my prose, uh, you know, it can maybe write a first draft, but every time I tried it, it felt like a little bit mediocre that I was like, oh, it, so I actually wouldn't suggest that because I think it takes out a lot of the creativity, but it can actually help you evaluate uh, your text based on certain uh, things that we put in, right? Like we talk about not have one source, uh, like, mm -hmm. you know, you want if, a plethora of sources. So actually a tool can uh, uh, mirror that to you and say like, hey, I think you need more sources here. Um, you know, you might want to tone down on the tone. Like, um, you know, did you objectively or without bias look at everyone, right? So I think it can actually help us a lot with our journalism um, and probably, you know, generative AI will take over as we go with like text creation or help with that. Um, I hope it will also find patterns or weird patterns in data set and can help us surface stuff for journalists. Um, I do think like the connecting the dots and the investigative journalism, um, mm -hmm. maybe the last thing that will be touched. I mean, I certainly think that uh, we obviously already see that in, in production that like sort of the quarterly report, sort of the road everyday task, sort of like HR task of like finding out how many vacation days you have or blah, 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 blah. Those can absolutely automate it. Um, and in fact, we've automated transcriptions and, you know, we have to still look as a journalist because there's still problems, uh, but we're not going to retranscribe everything, right? So like there are mm -hmm. huge co-pilots um, are, are helping us. I think, I mean, I'm hoping that with generative AI, and I'm sure with generated deep fakes and all kinds of, uh, the, mm -hmm. the world will be awash in text of, of dubious uh, 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 origin, that actually the factual information will become more important, that people right. do want that. Uh, uh, you know, and maybe that will put a premium on those resources that people will pay. And and, will and, and social proof, right? And social proof because credibility and trust of who the source is and knowing that it is actually that source will basically matter, will be revalued, I think. 
Yeah. So I think we're working on that. Like I'm sort of thinking like, yeah. how can we verify sources more closely? How can we make sure this is all a uh, factual base? We can go back to the origin. Where do some of these things come from? Uh, and I do think that like for investing in a lot of businesses, it's still critical information. Um, like you want to base your uh, business decision on real information and not just mm -hmm. generated text from a dubious source. So I think my hope is that it will survive and it has survived and we, we you know i feel like we've also needed it and uh, we see the value so hopefully that will continue yeah maybe this is the next book maybe it will also be ai and health <laughs> yeah exactly oh well, <laughs> and, and a little bit of go. work like i sort of uh, you know yeah, maybe the, the one of the chapters yeah. when we see how predictive health is moving into uh uh work and i think there's going to be a lot of uh friction and interest and um um, and I think we see so much, you know, AI moving into healthcare, and I think it's a high stakes environment, and I think it deserves to, uh, to be looked at. Fantastic. Listen, thank you for making time. Where can people follow you or find out more about your work? Obviously, I'll post a link to the book, and but uh, any other way in which people can either yeah, connect so or follow Yeah, so I have a website, uh, hilke.shalman.com. Uh, um, there's only one Hilke Shaman, so you'll find me. You'll also find okay. me on LinkedIn. I still have like a Twitter thing, but everyone is sort of like moving away from X. Sure. So I think links, LinkedIn is a great <laughs> way to find me. Um, and I love to connect with people. Fantastic. Thank you, Hilke, and have a great day. Thank yeah? you for having me.